Well, number one, I should say that I'm uh, very honored and uh, humbled to be a member of the panel. <coughs> I'm surrounded by scholars and survivors. Um, I should say that uh, uh, I was born in Germany in 1930. I guess I was a product of the safe harbor that we heard about. Well, if I remember my childhood, for a while it was very safe, especially when I was uh, two and three and four years old. And my parents were very happily citizens of Germany and practicing Jews at the same time. My father was an officer of the synagogue. My father was a physician. And security seemed to be very much a part of our life. In fact, if I remember, my father was the, among the first to own an automobile in our city. Well, that was, a, I guess, a material mark of success. And so I wasn't worried. And neither was my sister four years after I was born. And then, in 1933, to continue the story, Adolf Hitler came to power. And gradually the pressure on the Jews continued. In little bits and pieces. A couple of years, and for years, I should say that once we came to America, I never wanted to go back to Germany. Uh, we didn't speak German at home. I wouldn't buy any German products. I conducted my own war against the Third Reich. A few years ago, however, we went back to Germany to visit an Israeli couple who were studying post in Germany. And in Berlin, everywhere you look, there are or were, but better is the word are, reminders of what the Germans did to Jews. And it's not with Jewish money that they did it. They built memorials with German money. Always to remember, never to forget. There are stones in the sidewalk on the street corners. There are plaques in the railroad station from which Jews were transported to the camps. There are signs on telephone poles and lampposts saying that Jews were not permitted to listen to the radio after five o'clock, make telephone calls, let alone own a telephone. Now, as a little kid, I didn't remember any of that. But it certainly was a reminder of what life in the 1930s in Germany was like for Jews. And then came the Nuremberg Laws. Why Nuremberg? Because that's the place where they were promulgated. Which began to say, we're going to separate out the Jews from our society. 
Jewish doctors can only have Jewish patients. Jewish lawyers can only have Jewish clients. Jewish shopkeepers can only have Jewish customers. And Jewish children can't go to school with other children. <clears throat> so when it came time for me to go to school, it wasn't as easy as you think. The Jewish community of our town, of our city, the city was Upham in Upper Silesia. The Jewish community had to do something with and for the children. So they set up basically a one-room schoolhouse. I remember sitting in a room about half the size of this at a table with six other children and one elderly gentleman who was, you call him a teacher, but he didn't teach us anything because he had youngsters from age six to youngsters through high school, all in one room, all sitting in row after row, and he would walk up and down the rows telling us to be quiet. <laughs> so we learned <laughs> the one thing that it provided was safety. Safety for the children. The parents knew every day where the children were. And that was a very big accomplishment for that time. And then came November 9th, 1938. A day to live in infamy, to quote President Roosevelt. It was Crystal Night, otherwise known as the Night of the Broken Glass. It was targeted for Jews. The windows of the shopkeepers, the Jewish shopkeepers, were shattered. How did we know they were Jewish shopkeepers? Because on those windows there was a star of David and the word Judah, Jew. Every synagogue in Germany was set ablaze. And my father, being an officer of the synagogue, took me by the hand and we went together to see could we save Sifre Torahs, prayer books, anything that was salvageable. And we saw the fire department in all their glory with all their hoses pouring water on the neighboring buildings and watching, I guess, with some delight as the synagogue burned. <coughs> well, there was nothing to do but turn around and go home. And we had shortly, we had just gotten home when there was a knock on our apartment door. It was one of my father's Christian patients. And he said to my father, if you know what's good for you, you'll be out of here in a half hour because the SS is right behind me. My father and mother, in their great wisdom, had somehow made plans for us to leave Germany, but not on November 9th, 1938, 
sometime in Germany, in January. We had tickets on the SS Manhattan of the American shipping line. But my father, listening to his patient, grabbed a small bag, put in some clothes, kissed my mother, and said goodbye, and off he went. Without papers, without a ticket, to try to make his way from East Germany to the port of Hamburg. We didn't know on that night whether we would ever see my father again. My mother was left with the two of us, and each time she would hear a noise in the hall, she would push my sister and me under the bed and tell us to be quiet. That went on November, December, and into January, day and night. My mother was terrified, and the terror was catching. I don't know about my sister. She never wants to talk about this. She has, I guess, what we call survivor's guilt. But I'm eager to talk about it. It helps a great deal to talk about it. It's important that people hear about it. Because we really haven't learned very much. So, terrified as we were, come January, and I don't remember the date, we made our way to Hamburg as well, tickets in hand. And I remember that day on the dock when my mother said to me, now, the ship is down there. You're going to walk down this long dock. Now you look neither to the right nor to the left. You kind of hold your breath because if you make eye contact with the Germans, they'll get you. And so, there we went. And we knew that once we were on that ship, an American ship, that's safe harbor. Germany no longer was a safe harbor. That ship was a safe harbor. And two weeks it took. In the winter, on the Atlantic Ocean, and I remember I have never been so seasick in my life. <laughs> and I spent most of those two weeks in the cabin, lying down, <coughs> and if I can say it, puking my guts out. <laughs> now, I don't know whether that was from terror or from the storm. Maybe a little bit of both. And my sister celebrated her fourth birthday on the ship, and she was everywhere having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> and we came to America in the middle of winter in January, and I made the headlines of the Herald Tribune. A picture on the front page of my sister and me looking out at the Statue of Liberty. Dressed in winter clothes. We didn't have to go to Ellis Island because my parents had tickets, first class tickets, to come to America. And there on the dock was my father. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, here we are in America. Oh, the other passenger. <laughs> when we left Germany, my mother said, of oh, course, well, you know, in Germany, when you're doing well, you have all the toys you need, all the toys you want. So my mother said, you can take one thing. 
There he is. There she is. Transgender, maybe. <laughs>
Jews on the Upper West Side who studied English, spoke German in the street, lived in one room for years, but made their way as proud citizens of this country.